hello everybody and welcome to the Just for Laughs SPX panel here in virtual space. I'm here with Ben Passmore, Francesca Lynn, and Killian Ng. I'm Jay Michaelin. Um, I'm a critic, I'm a writer, I'm an editor, and sometimes I moderate panels and my pronouns are she, her. Who wants to go next? Oh, yeah, I guess. Um, I'm Francesca Lynn. My pronouns are she, her. Um, I am a comic and also someone who writes about comics, which is confusing to everyone, even myself. And I don't, I'm, and I'm bad at introducing myself, but I'm excited to talk. <laughs> ben, you want to go next? Okay, yeah. Um, my name is Ben Passmore, he, him. Um, I am uh, primarily known as a political cartoonist these days, although I, I enjoy doing genre stuff like horror and sci-fi. Um, I'm known mostly for my regular work at the NIV and the comic Your Black Friend, but also um, I you know, did the art on a book called Bottom Feeders that came out last year, and um, a, uh, also a book that came out last June called Sports is Hell through Koyama Press. Yeah. Gang, gang. You're up, Killian. Hey, I'm Killian. My pronouns are they and them. And I am a comic artist in that I draw. I also draw for comic, sorry, video games, um, some animation. Just anyone who needs background art, a lot of people do. I'm also, I also exist on the internet. Just probably where most people know me from. <laughs> <laughs> so let's get started. So Francesca, um, you actually mentioned um, talking about comics and um, writing about comics, but you're also actually a comic. And I wanted to get um, your take on how you see the most successful gags or jokes in them. What are the things that really make a joke work on the page for you? And is there any overlap with um, comic work in terms of comic as a person rather than comic as an item? I think there's like a ton, there's like a ton of overlap, especially with gag comics in that, like, I think people are used to like maybe a traditional joke, a joke structure, right? Like there's like a premise, a setup and then punchline. And then you see that a lot in like a lot of gag comics. But then also I think with comics, which is probably why they're so awesome, is that comics are a good way of also tapping into humor that's just like super visceral as well that like you maybe don't need words for which like you know like something's funny and you know like, you couldn't like break down the joke structure and then it like doesn't become funny or like it's just something that you see and you're like that's funny I don't know why it's funny I can't break it down anymore comics do that too like think all the time where it's like uh it's more about like in someone's body like and I guess that's like the furthest like end of it the most like 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 something like, like a fart joke is still funny, but like also just like things that are just very visceral and of the body that you maybe can't even ver verbalize too. I love it. It's like high and low art always all at once. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Do, um, I guess the, what I sort of imagined would be uh, a diff or a divergence is, um, like the the ability to to improvise maybe maybe probably not, but the, yeah. yeah but then i also think that people come up with things that are so funny that are maybe funnier than something that's super polished that i see that it's so much more funny or so much more my speed that are quicker like especially with mini comics that people make that they're mm. like maybe they wrote it in like a, an hour and i'm like this is just like you know an improvised joke that's like a killer um, and I, like, I think it's people like, like Kate Beaton's like quick, like really quick sketches that she'll do and then post on Twitter. Mm -hmm. And I'm just like, oh, that like, I feel like that had to only could that like genius can only come and like, you know, writing it in 10 minutes. Yeah. And like doing right. it. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It would be sort of nice um, to like, be able to polish a comic in like a more public way like if there was a comics version of like an open mic night which i guess is what like uh mini comics at indie shows are sort of like but i feel like people would call me out if i reuse that like redrew the same comic a few times like i've read this in a mini comic six times ben 
Yeah, that's a good, yeah, that's a really good point. Oh my God, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I think there's definitely something to the style of something that's been really quickly sketch out. It feels more organic in that first pass. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What do you guys think a comics improv could look like? Like just an actual set from like would a, is a drink and draw, which I know um, Gosh Comics in London will sometimes do drink and draws where they just kind of get artists together on a theme. Everyone has like some drinks and like draw some stuff on that theme. Is that kind of what you would all envision or do you think there is something else that we can imagine as a comics improv session? It's a good question. It is interesting that it's like, I, in some ways it feels like you have to remove like the, or like add something to comics to make it feel sort of more organic or just cause it's such like a personal thing, right? It's like you draw a comic, like, like me, the thing that I liked about comics ever since I was little is that like, I don't have to leave my room and I don't, you know, <laughs> and through the magic of like, you know, capitalism and commodity, most of the people that interact with my comic, I don't have to watch them do it, you know? Um, but it does, it does like, all the collaboration could just be separate from me but um but yeah i could see a i could see a drink and draw being sort of sort of that something that i i feel like indie comics sort of misses um or lacks uh for better and worse maybe is like the um it doesn't have sort of like the the same sort of like uh, production structures, like the big two, you know, it's mm -hmm. like there's not a writer, pencil, or inker. And sometimes I miss that. It would be sort of nice to be on a team um, and see what, like, what comes out. Um, and that might be maybe sort of more comparable. I don't know. My question, oh, go ahead, please. Right. Sorry. Uh, if, um, there are a couple of community events that approach the idea of a comics improv, like there's the 24 hour comic day where mm -hmm. some people mm -hmm. like people everyone interprets it differently but the way it's been passed around recently is you just make a comic every hour about usually about something that's happened although i think in some earlier versions some people tried to make it like a whole production like they write in advance or they try to do mm. like an entire story about it instead of just you know daily events what you did in the last hour and a lot of those mm -hmm. tend to be really funny. Like those tend mm -hmm. to be right. funny comics. So that's interesting too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. It feels like humor can accommodate like certain aspects, like sub, sub, like certain kinds of abstractions that are sort of inherent in having to do a comic in 24 hours. You're like time skips, like, you know, sort of um, non sequiturs. Um, I don't know, I think about that a lot. It's like there's, it, you do sort of have a cushion when it comes to comedy. They're like, suddenly we're here now. Suddenly I'm eating mm -hmm. chips, I guess. Yeah, it's like, <laughs> it's like you've put a punchline to, you've put a conclusion to the last hour of your life. This is the most significant thing that happened. Yeah, and that's really right. interesting. Yeah, that's really interesting too, because a lot of times when they, people give you advice with jokes and they say like to connect with like an audience and stuff, like you want it to be, even if it's not a story that just happened, you want to tell it like it's a story that just happened. Or you want to be like, mm -hmm. and my roommate was saying, you don't want to say like, oh, it's like my roommate from like five years ago said this one time. You're going to be like, this roommate, yeah, this roommate that I had. And and so it's like the always like in the now. Yeah, that's, that's yeah, that's another, that's a much smarter connection than the things I jotted down for this panel. <laughs> Yeah, that's real. There's like, there's like a degree of like immediacy that seems like that's a common theme within stand-up comedy. It's like, I guess on, in some level, I know, you know, it's like, I know a lot of these things are pre-written just like comics, but it's like, it seems like the success helps if it's like, oh, hey, like, we're all building this joke in the moment. One thing I wanted to touch on since Ben, you mentioned the, you liked the idea of working on a team and working in a team and I wanted to potentially drop a tiny little bomb in here and wonder, um, you think the jokes land better when there's one person working on it, like the cartoonist is just doing it or is a team creating jokes together potentially make a comics joke better? Like specifically like because it's a work of art that like is met with images and words and sometimes doesn't you need, even need words, frequently doesn't. But what do you guys potentially think about, should there just be, do the, do the best jokes come from a single person or a team? 
I want to know what these cartoonists think because I don't I honestly like I know that y'all write <laughs> your own stuff but I like I don't understand how y'all write all of that and it's funny and it's good and it's all together and it's just one person's mind like I don't understand it like it doesn't make sense to me. <laughs> like how <laughs> Uh, yeah, Killian, you want to take that one? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it depends on the writer understanding the medium of the comic. It under, it like, a writer that writes jokes that work in text only is fine, but a writer that understands how to convey the joke also with the visual component, it, it makes, it makes the comic, right? Like, there are gags that you can only do with plays. There, there are some gags where it's just like someone makes a really funny face. <laughs> or someone reacts in a very strange way versus you right. know word wordplay puns you can have that in like a podcast and you, do, you don't need the visual medium although that can enhance <laughs> it <laughs> right yeah i personally um i'm like uh despite my politics of um, like a, incredibly resistant to collaboration in comics, uh, even though I've, I've done some of it. Um, but I, I saying that like, uh, like when I was working on bottom feeders, you know, I was just doing the art and me and Ezra talked about subject matter and tone. Um, and I, f I guess I found that things hit better when we spent a lot of time working on it. Uh, and in my own personal work, I don't actually spend, like, I don't do that many edits. You know what I mean? I think the, the sheer, like, uh, amount of typos in all my published work is probably evidence <laughs> of how, how little I go back and revise things. I guess personally, like, immediacy really helps. Um, but, um, yeah, I think you have to have other eyes look on it because I think also I I find I find like when I do things by myself and I just like post it or send it in I always like rec like reflect like in my head will be like oh my god I don't actually know if this makes any sense like I I did this I finished this at like six in the morning like you know I have, I have no idea like <laughs> so I think it you know it helps to get another pair of eyes on it um what do you mean by like it hits better? Just lands or like if it's funnier or like Um I think it's deeper. Like you have to something that I think is nice about indie comics especially is that people or my experience of it is that people really um respond to things that feel like genuinely like your POV. Um and and they're not and that so that seems like an inextricable inextricable part of people's enjoyment of comics within that space with like the more like with the nib stuff that I do. Um, yeah. Like universality, it seems to be more important than like subjectivity. Um, so in that way, it's like, like people really want to feel sort of like talk to in ways that they can like sort of like internalize in themselves. So in that sense, it's like, I feel like I, for me to get out of my head, I need someone else to like look at what I'm doing you know what I mean? It's like sort of like a mirror because uh, people are sort of, I guess, less charmed by like, okay, Ben, like this is, this is a weird reference to your mother, but I'm <laughs> riding with it, you know, like, um, so definitely I think like format, format matters. Like, um, like what you were saying about like, a, like someone who is only a writer can do comics, but I think in certain settings they have to be able to sort of understand how to write for comics specifically, which is like, you have to, like, text, to, like, writing text is just as important as recognizing where text is not necessary, I guess. Yeah. I don't think it has anything to do with, like, the expensiveness or the amount of people of collaboration. Just, you know, need to have people who are on your wavelength, people who know what you're trying to do or, like, can understand you and your audience. For sure. With the, like, definitely something I've noticed this is like another conversation but with like um like I've been made like like who your editor like uh also matters um like I mostly have white editors and I've definitely done con like done content that I thought was really funny and they're like I don't understand this at all 
And at first I'm like, oh, maybe the joke isn't funny. And I was like, oh no, this is cultural. <laughs> oh no. <laughs> I can, yeah, I mean, I can definitely relate to that. Just doing like kind of my little bit of like, you know, doing some stand up stuff. And a lot of my other friends that do stand up are like straight white dudes. And mm. like, I'll have references and I'll be like, oh, this is not maybe that funny. But then I'll actually like take a risk and do it on stage. And like a lot of times, like the people performing will be, it's mostly men still kind of dominating mm. stand up. But like the audience will be more than half women and they will like women of all kinds and they will think it is funny. Like, and cause the men, I just realized, oh, they didn't get it. Like I did like a little small bit about, and I was like, but I'm here and I, and I have a bodysuit on already. So like half the battle is won. And all the women were like <laughs> cheering cause they got it. Cause the men, they're like, what, are, what is she talking about? Like, what is that? But they know mm. that struggle of getting that snap on and off, like an open and use it. And so they were just, they thought it was funny. So I'm like, yeah, I need to, make sure to kind of like things should be people should be able to get it but also to be confident enough to realize like oh yeah it might not just be that they don't understand that reference so there might be there i mean it might be just be that it might be something that it's like i'm just gonna do one for these ladies i'm gonna do jokes that like you know mostly only my other black friends will get and that's that's mm. okay <laughs> yeah Ben, you actually mentioned some of the work that you do and kind of also jokes landing in your work. Um, and you mentioned the work that you do um, as a mostly a political cartoonist um, with the NIB, but you also have done some collaboration um, work as well. But could you talk a little bit about the role of comedy in work that's not necessarily strictly comedic or might even be a little bit emotional? For sure, yeah. Um, I, th I think that... Um, yeah, uh, increasingly, I like to write about, um, like, like history stuff, which on his face is like, like pretty boring. Like, I, like, as a kid, like, I, I don't even think I really like, I didn't, I straight up didn't read a book, I think, until my 20s. And I certainly didn't touch a history book for a while. Um, and I think largely because you know, I was a poor reader. And also I just like, it was hard. It was hard for me to like, feel like it was very tangible what I was reading. Um, and I think something that is, I think the humor is very uh, humanizing um, and it's very grounding. So like one of my, one of my favorite things, especially now is to sort of like, um, for instance, I did a comic about MLK and this guy named Robert F. Williams, um, who was a end of LACP organizer in North Carolina in the fifties. And he's sort of like, he's like the precursor to the, like the, the armed self-defense movement. Um, I mean, armed self-defense of the black community is basically just as long as we've been here, but you know, like within the thread of the civil rights movement, he was like the clans out here with guns. So I'm gonna go ahead and get some guns. Anyway, so he so he had sort of like a debate with MLK, and I drew the comic, um, and I put me and W. E. Du Bois in it, and I think like I could have just written it as a straight, um, as a straight comic, just sort of documenting the discussion that they had, MLK and Rod F. Williams. That would have that's super interesting. These are obviously very very smart people with like increasingly diverging sort of senses of like what should be done about like liberation and freedom. But I, th I just, I thought about that and I was like, you know, like I was thinking about like public talks that I've been to where it's like mostly, I don't know, it's like mostly black people. It's like other like, and it's like different revolutionaries. Like I was just at an event with like old, like OG, like black liberation army, ex-prisoners and people from MOVE. And you know, there's like, they're talking, people are talking in the crowd people in the crowd are talking to the people that are trying to talk, people in the crowd are talking to each other about what's happening. So I was like, you know, it's probably more grounding if I just have a comic where me and W.E.B. Du Bois, who are from the same town, are just sort of like, you know what I mean? Maybe being a little disrespectful, but you know, commenting on what's happening. And that just felt like more grounding. Um, so I, I find that humor, like, uh, it keeps my attention better and I feel like it, it grounds the people as actual people. Like it works against that sort of, um, 
it I feel like it bridges the distance of time and also works against sort of like our socialized understanding as figures as sort of like great men. You know, like in the case of W. Du Bois, like he's literally like he grew up, I think like two miles away from where I grew up. You know what I mean? Like, so I was just, cont he's also a mixed dude. Like, I'm just thinking, I was like, I don't know. Like he went to the Green River and probably got drunk too. You know what I mean? Like, this is just another guy. You know, he's like very relatable. Um, so yeah, in general, in general, I think that's my approach. And also because I like to write about riots and stuff. Um, I feel like sort of, I try to defang them with like a certain amount of slapstick, um, like a situation that would otherwise be scary. I think that one of the things that I've found about reading comics where um, it's supposed to, it's not necessarily supposed to be serious, but as a serious topic or an emotional topic, and kind of as you described, um, you mentioned defanging, which I think is kind of interesting. The thing that I've thought about also is kind of how to make, how to make things more realistic in a, in a sort of way, like in that mm. we're all still telling jokes, like in, maybe not in the moment of a riot, but probably in the moments leading up to riots and the moments that I think maybe some of us or a lot of us have had during, um, I mean, the pandemic, during, um, you know, the continued murder of black people, um, that we all still kind of have this gallows humor about it, that humor is kind of part of the natural thing. And, and very rarely do we kind of take a moment to stop and say, now we will have some jokes, like jokes are just kind of part of it. Do you, mm. do you all think about the naturalistic concept of, of comedy at all in terms of your, your work and like how, how, how jokes can make things feel more real, even though they're also not serious, I guess? I think so, yeah. I also think that like a lot of times like if you meet someone who's maybe grown up with not a lot of adversity, they're probably not gonna be very funny. They're not, like they're not, they're not gonna be funny. Like that's just, and they're not gonna be funny and they also tend to like not know why things are funny if other people have maybe been able to like find some catharsis and I mean, I think there's a difference and sometimes people will take it to mean that if you're joking about it, that means that, that the situation is okay, but that's not the same thing. It's the, this idea that you are joking about this, you are sharing your pain and translating it in a way that probably the people that are laughing hardest can also understand that pain um, in ways that I think is becomes, can become like this this idea of empathy. Like I've met a lot of people who have had like just utter complete trauma and they're the funniest people I know. Some of them are like comics, some of them are just funny people, but we can laugh about these things and tell these like kind of brutal jokes to each other in a way that I think is like productive um, to, um, um, for ourselves and for healing and not really necessarily even for like an audience like this idea that you have to that it's some kind of because sometimes I think we think of performance in a way that just means performative and it's not necessarily the same thing yeah yeah like I'm kind of when I I'm not sure that it would be defanging a situation to add humor because people don't stop making jokes because bad things are happening it's adding like a sense of currency to it like people just bad things are happening and they're I, I wouldn't say coping with it but the jokes don't stop mm -hmm. and I, yeah and I like the discomfort sometimes in an audience that's one of my favorite things when you're calling out like when you're calling out some bullshit it's dis. like I think that's why I was like really excited to start talking about this because of because of your black friend, because now that's a comic that I've taught a couple times in classes now in college. And like, it makes certain students uncomfortable because because it is funny and because there are tends to be like other black students that are laughing at it because they recognize it. But then the other students that are maybe not laughing are uncomfortable in a way that is probably very educational and instructive to them as to why they can sit in that discomfort in a way that is maybe a little bit um that is it's they're still uncomfortable but they can kind of sit in it a, maybe a little bit easier than like where i to be like hey we're going to talk about white privilege today 
students and it's like no they're sitting in there and they're learning about it but they're able to be like oh this is like not for what this is a thing that's not for me like what like i've 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 never considered there <laughs> being you know there being like all this stuff out there that is not in some way catered towards me and i think that's really important thinking about what you actually said Killian um because the other thing I I have a huge passion for omake comics like the short comics in um in Japanese comics frequently that kind of end up in the end or in the middle and you'll even have them in like very serious long comics or relatively serious long comics like you'll still kind of have that takeaway moment um and actually I think recently or relatively recently they published like just the gags of like the Full Metal Alchemist collection that's like just yeah for joke comics and nothing else. Um, and I've been thinking for a while about how, um, how comedy kind of in those more serious leaning, like for example, Full Metal Alchemist is a relative, like all things considered is a relatively serious comic, but there's still plenty of jokes in it. But I think when they put the humor in it, especially, I think kind of what makes it work is that it shows that there's an existence of these people beyond the main plot line. And I think it makes them mm. more grounded do you, have you guys had similar like observations of that either in your own work or in other works or feeling the use of humor to round out characters or round out situations or any feelings about that? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, something I, I think, I guess something I used to talk to Ezra about a lot uh, was like, um, we would talk about things that aren't funny, like, um, uh, like, uh, and I guess the best, I can't think of a show right now, but like, there's a lot of Christian television and like just content that's like not very funny. And, um, and I, I, for whatever reason, I grew up really Christian, but I, I always thought it was like, why is, why is there not like, why is it just like not very funny or very good? And I think some of it has to do with like, um, whatever content aside, like, I think a big part of it is like related to what you're saying in that like, there's not much self-reflection and I feel like humor in those, in the formats where it's like the end of like a, like a graphic novel or something, or it's like a little, like a little clip, like a, almost like a slice of life sort of speaks to like a certain kind of like awareness. Um, so I feel like that, yeah, that kind of thing is like essential for like humor and, and relatability. Like, yeah. I'm actually not sure because humor is a very, easily shareable thing. I'm less, I don't know if it would be right to say that there is a use in humor to rounding out characters so much as maybe they had all these ideas and the ones that were funny were the ones that made the cut into those extra material. So it's rounding out the characters and because this one was presented in a funny way they're like oh yeah this is the one that I'm going to put actually like put effort into drawing this one out because there is you know, a full joke told in this arc. Mm. Well, I mean, sometimes a joke can just be a joke, but I mean, if, if things that are sort of, if you've built a relationship to a character and you have this one understanding of the character and sort of like the additional comic, like I think my understanding of a like a common approach to humor is like you're, you're sort of subverting something that we, you know, subverting something that we had like a previous understanding of. So in that way, I think it can be uh, a, a way of rounding a character out. If the character themselves or, or a new situation is sort of like subverting our prior understanding of the character or is mm -hmm. sort of readjusting it. Yeah, that's true. Um, yeah, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Lillian, um, I wanted to bring up some, so you mentioned uh, your work in comics and games and animation, um, but what some people may or may not know about you is that you also make fan comics. Um, and I think, uh, I, I would say at least your greatest hits are probably Cowboy Hot Pants Sasuke and Elsa Uchiha, if I'm wrong. But lately you are a little more into Fire Emblem. And also if anyone wants to see all, all, both of those comics, I have them, don't worry. Um, but either way, it's, it's been my observation that um, the most successful fan comics, I think with some exceptions, but the most successful ones tend to be the ones with the most gags. So why do you think gags have such staying power in the fan comic realm in particular? 
I mean, I think humor is just more shareable. People are just more willing to laugh than they are to like share around a comic that makes them uncomfortable or makes them sad about a character. And it's just, it's also easier to share like outside of the immediate community, usually. Like it's one thing to have an attachment to a character and have like a sad insight about them. And it's another to just like, like you don't need to really understand Naruto <laughs> to find some kind of humor in this. I, in my opinion, the joke of Cowboy Hot Pants Sasuke is, is that everyone's horny. It's, it's fine. <laughs> That's, there's, there's no joke. It's just like the original comic was not that horny. The, fan, the fans are horny. That's amazing. I was going to say that, like, because I looked up stuff on y'all before we did this panel, and I don't know what Fire Emblem is, because I, I don't know, I'm just out of touch with everything. Like, I'm like, I don't know if that's a video game, another comic, a movie, a manga, like, is it anime? And I was laughing at the Fire Emblem stuff that Killian made, with uh, what, what they made without, like, knowing what, what that, even the source was. I was like, these are funny. I like a pun. I like, you know, I like some, <laughs> like, I like some gas. Like I wanna, I wanna read this. Yeah. I also do feel like, um, at least in my experience of having read, I've participated in like a lot of anime and manga fandoms. I feel like presenting a joke as a fan comic does kind of come out of the omake section. Like having seen that in a manga, other artists are gonna be like, I'm also gonna make these little silly jokes about the story in more or less the same format yeah, in a way that I in the way that I've seen less of in like book fandom or maybe even western comic fandom but I can't say that like I I would love to be proven wrong it's just that I'm not in that fandom as much so I haven't seen so much of it yeah I think there's a I mean I guess because I'm in similar circles so even for books like major books or major shows like I read a, a I, like my favorite way to consume fan content I found is like fan comics I don't really read very much fan fiction even for stuff that because I have my own things about like um you know text versus images but I feel like fan comics have always been really successful at just meeting people where they are um and it's really actually interesting to me for Jessica that you mentioned looking up Fire Emblem and just immediately like getting the jokes without any context which I think is kind of fascinating um then do you have any thoughts or feelings about fan comics at all <laughs> <laughs> not not really um I uh I regret that I don't I don't interact with uh fan content that much I um yeah I have I I even I tend to have, like have an appreciation for like the content that like a lot of these things are based off of, even though like, you know, I think I came to Naruto like super late. So I, I just like couldn't get through the the anime or the mangas, even though my friends were like, you got to stick with this. I was like, yo, it's too much. Um, but it's anyway, fine. I love all that stuff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, people but, um, know me, yeah. people have known me for years as Naruto fan, but I, I never finished it. It's fine. You're a real <laughs> fan, you know? <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I feel like most of the most of the fan content I end up interacting with is just like memes. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, like just mad Dragon Ball, Naruto, One Piece. Like, I just like someone will just hit me with the memes. That's like not even a weed like that. I'm like, I get this. <laughs> this is very funny. <laughs> Are those fan comics though? Is a meme a fan comic? That's a good question. Um, yeah, probably. Yeah, probably. Let's just I, say yes. I think they are. I think, I, I think yes. Yeah. But there was like one half of the fandom that had come from like more comic stuff and they were actually, they just called it a fan comic. And then when like internet in jokes, like Rick Rolling and stuff that wasn't just like the, the joke itself wasn't just an image, people pulled up the word meme. And then I think mm. people who use the word meme saw, or like people who had been exposed to internet jokes under the word meme, started to use the word meme to anything funny they found on the internet. So then it kind of like yeah. 
meme started being applied to comics and you know like the rage comics they just called that meme it's it is kind of a comic it's like a one panel <laughs> sometimes right right i i mean i'm sure we'll see them in the new yorker in like a you know a couple years just arthur just arthur memes every page <laughs> i mean people have done Oh, there was like dino- dinosaur comics by Ryan North. The one, oh like, yeah, he, dinosaur yeah, he was just great. Yeah, I love that. Right. Where I, I mean, I'm sure most people know, but it's it's the same panel progression of panels, but Ryan North has like written a different caption, like a completely different dialogue for every comic. I I don't know how many comics it went for. Oh, because it was years and years. Yeah. And you do like a different one every day. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Yeah. Those are yeah. awesome. The drawer in me, which I'm, I'm sure y'all relate to, uh, resents the, <laughs> resented the, those web comics. Like I used to read, um, oh, what what was the one? But it was another one that was sort of like, oh, get your war on, which I really enjoyed. But I was like, yo, it's just clip art. I'm so upset. <laughs> like I spent so much hours drawing. <laughs> upset, like jealous, envious, upset. <laughs> Yeah, but not jealous of something that's like <laughs> constructive. I'd be like, "This is popular. I hate it." Now. Okay, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know what I mean. It's like that's corny. That's just hater. That's um, yeah. that's just drinking the haterade. Yeah, because my my experience looking at like, because I used to be into Homestuck too. My experience mm. looking at these mm. like, I'm gonna call them low polish or low visual polish things has always been like that's really incredible that they made this thing with these visual constraints and they were just really focusing on the writing to convey the joke. Right. It's interesting too, cause it feels like, like some of these, like, like, like the older the internet gets, like I've noticed that there's more and more things that are just referencing the older internet, like the, like the internet I grew up with, which is interesting to me. Um, and it's sort of interesting. And so like some of like the, like I'll see comics that are sort of like, you know, it, like drawn intentionally bad or sort of maybe like referencing like a, like a, like an earlier internet. And that's interesting because like, also like, co- like in comics, people do that, right? Like how many people are like, oh, you're trying to do Kirby, like, or yo, you're trying to do like the yellow kid, like that era, crazy cat, something like that. So in, in a lot of ways, it, it just feels like sort of a continuum of it. You know what I mean? I think it's, it's just sort of, yeah, I wish maybe there was even more subgenres because obviously we're trying to do something different, you know. Um, the priorities are different, but they're both valid to me. So to wrap up, I asked the three of you for your favorite, um, prior to the panel, I asked for your three, the three of you for your favorite gags in comics or at least ones that kind of made you laugh recently. Um, so I want to share that with everybody give me one second and we can kind of just talk through some of them i think my favorite gag is actually kakashi's mask but <laughs> that, everyone knows that one we don't need to all right so this is one of the ones that um that ben sent then it, it's all f- it's the f- it's four pages for this one and then the other one is just a single page correct yeah, it's just a single page. Okay. So yeah, I guess this rule this requires going through. Yeah. <laughs> so I think that's the the first sequence. <laughs> yeah, that's the first one. <laughs> have Have y'all read this comic, Asteris Polyp, that came out probably a bunch of years ago by David Muzicelli? I actually never have read that. I've only heard good things, but I've never read it. Yeah. It's, um, I think, like, so this in of itself, in of, in of itself, I feel like sort of, like, encapsulates, like, this joke. But this is the end of the book. And the book doesn't, like, I think this joke hits, it hits hardest if you read the whole thing. Unfortunately, like, in a lot of ways, the whole book is sort of, like, leading into this moment. And it's a story about like a man coming to understand sort of like his limitations sort of forged by his upbringing, sort of like the pain he causes, 
Like it's a very self-reflective, it's a beautifully drawn book, but it's incredibly self-reflective. It's very slow. And then it sort of ends with this, um, like arguably sort of like <laughs> maybe tragic or like sort of like nihilistic end uh, that isn't explained. And I guess I, I sort of just enjoy, I enjoy the subversion of that. You know what I mean? Like sort of like the grounding of that, um, that there's sort of this priority to um, to sort of like undercut the self-seriousness of the work, which is something that I personally appreciate um, in all in all comics that I read and probably something I strive for. And then, uh, yeah, the next one is uh, an excerpt of uh, this book Chester Brown did about Louis Rial, the, um, the Canadian revolutionary. And this one just feels like, I actually looked at this recently. I was like, oh shit, I think I might've just in part ripped off Chester Brown's approach to, <laughs> to some of these things. <laughs> Because I feel like I've for real done versions of this page before where it's like you're expecting like it's an unexpected response like it's a historical comic like it's a high stakes situation but everyone's just sort of like talking casually um, <laughs> in just sort of regular voices. But anyway, I think it, it hits on its own with that explanation um, and is maybe just a different version of the of the prior example. I think it's kind of the timing here that's the most interesting and also for for the four page sequence previously too that kind of just mm -hmm. is, each one of them at least requires a single kind of silent moment i think without this panel it would be less fun right. like this one here where they just look at each other and kind of have a moment to think and similarly in the previous panels um or sorry in the previous pages you also kind of have these silent moments um, mm -hmm. How do you, because I think we've talked a little bit about um, comics in person, but um, as in like people comics, um, but for mm. on, pa on the page, um, how do you think about timing? How do, how do uh, I mean, any of you think about timing? Timing is something, if you're doing like live, any sort of live comedy, it's like always good to play with that's like a thing that I remember hearing um advice at the beginning of like when you're telling your jokes and you're getting your jokes down and you're doing that kind of stuff remember to like leave pauses for like the laughter like that's a thing that people don't maybe think to do like you pause and you're basically like telling the audience to some degree like when to laugh and it actually is like a lot more effective than you would ever think like because people tend when they're starting to like be afraid if I stop and they don't laugh, what happens? But if you have put like meaningful pauses in things, usually that's like where you get the laughter. Yeah. Yeah, it makes sense. I mean, also like, I think one of the struggles for comics is something that is like for most of the time is just a, a book comprised of like a series of tiny pictures. Like um, one of the hard things is sort of like recreating like how the human mind sort of experiences time um in this way that isn't in the way that like movies or television are sort of not re restricted in that way like in movies and film you can sort of simulate sort of like the human experience of like time but comics is like it's incredibly unnatural and something i think something i i like about this sort of like three tier this like six panel format and sort of similar to strips is that they are sort of like um they are sort of, they're relentlessly rigid. So I think something that is sort of like a, like a very comics problem that I really, really like is cartoonists that are sort of trying to replicate the experience of time and like probably the like most unnatural format. Um, so yeah, this, so the spaces I feel like are important, right? It's like a, it's a, it's that can be a moment of self-reflection, like an experience, like an experience of time. I guess I also like Chester Brown because he does, you know, because he's all, like a much older generation. So he does like these like super comics things like that, like panel that is like it's jump to, you know, it's just jumping and it's just like and so. Um, so I my favorite comics, I think, are sort of doing the same thing, sort of doing like the very like golden age era sort of thing where it's like we're not pretending we're in the real world. We're, you know, we're hitting captions. We're jumping to different places with no explanation. 
Um, but I, I like Chester Brown, especially because he does that mix of sort of like contemporary comics, like trying to like draw things out and create a, like you can, you can even set a metronome to a lot of his comics, particularly like this Louis Real comic, but also does like very comic-y comic stuff. Yeah, I think comics, like the space that you have in comics, it kind of is like, you know, creating that space in stand-up or like it's, um, you can't just have things happening constantly. You need a little bit of space to think. Not, not even just about gags, but just about story beats, um, characters interacting. And then I have uh, Francesca's pickup next from uh, Olivia James, one of the uh, Nancy strips. Yeah, I picked this um, because I thought it was interesting because it is a, like a lot of some of the newer Nancy ones. It's like a meta commentary, but it also kind of draws from like a very traditional like joke ja gag structure. You know, we've got like this setup this like premise and the setup and then like the punchline and it's also like just so like also just so silly in the punchline that like I had to love it because I really kind of am like just someone who likes kind of like dumb jokes like that like I think like that's so like that's so stupid that I love it but it's just like she's so determined that yeah like yeah okay he's bought too <laughs> um, just, like and I just like love it and the fa just like even the things like the face like that's not like she's just so like just a spunky little jerk about it and I love that I love all of the new Nancy. It's Me real good. too. Me too. It's just so like sharply done and um, just a really, really, really consistently hilarious um, comics. I, I also like that um, this joke, it's great on its own, but like it's kind of building on this in-story personality of Nancy. So like yeah. the more the more you read Nancy, the funnier it gets because you're kind of like, Oh, this is a classic Nancy. She's yeah, like, oh. it feels in a lot of ways like some of the old, it, it, like, because not all of them, and I don't think they have to be, like, not all of the new Nancy kind of plays on, like, earlier Ernie Bushmiller stuff, but I think this one really does in a lot of ways, because old Nancy had, like, gadgets, and it also, just also still has, like, so much of the, like, the tood that she has had. All right, and then the last but certainly not least for Killian's picks. So we have some pages from Dungeon Meishi. I don't know <laughs> in my order, but I'm just going to go through them quickly. Or not quickly, but enough that people can read them. So this one's yeah, this is, it's, I just feel like um, Dungeon Meishi has a really great mix of character humor, visual gags, some jokes that are more like, just changes in mood. It's like, you know, what do you call it, like a whiplash? Mm -hmm. Yeah. This is more a joke because um, the ca this character is normally, oh, he's actually in the next gag. He normally has like, he normally looks like this. He's a dwarf. He normally looks like that. Mm. So in that one kind of side story, they've all been like their D and D races have all been switched, so every panel, this guy shows up. He's just like sparkling and oh. very pretty, and it. Mm. I I get that it's probably not funny looking from the outside, but every time he shows up as like this beautiful elf, it just kills me. <laughs> you said their classes switch up. Yeah, it's kind of like dungeon dungeons Dra dungeons and dragons based. So, like, right. there's an elf the dwarf is like a half foot. There's like regular humans. I need to read this immediately, I feel. Yeah, I'm, what's it what's it called? <laughs> yeah, Dungeon Mesh, right? Or Delicious in okay. Dungeon is oh, yeah. the um <laughs> the localized title, but the weebs call it Dungeon Meshy. Dungeon Meshy. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, right. this drawing actually really kills me. This one here. Like <laughs> <laughs> I think, I mean, all of this is funny, but like this reaction image is so good and so satisfying. 
Um, like yeah. kind of in the, in the kind of converse way that this one is, you know, like you kind of mm -hmm. have to mm -hmm. So it, it, it's just, it's just a really nice, this, this whole setup actually in this panel with the inset and everything is really great. Yeah, um, that's something I like about manga in particular. They're, they're not afraid to go a little off model just to make it really ridiculous when they need it to be. Mm. Yeah. I was like the the like the jumps in tone. Like I always really appreciated that that there's not like a like a fear necessarily, or like it adds to the humor that like like you. I guess like you were saying, it's like I like the like the funny compositions. Like we're we're in and out of sort of like like realistic space a lot. You know what I mean? Um. Yeah, I appreciate that about about manga a lot. It feels yeah. very comics. Yeah, there's not like a hesitation to like get into like melodrama for effect. I think that's like really cool and like can be super hilarious too, which is that seems like what's going on with this gag. And now I want to read every single one. Yeah, it's funny. My secret agenda. <laughs> My dungeon mesh agenda. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, I think that we're basically almost out of time. Um, so I want to just make sure everyone knows how to find you if they need to find you or if you want to be found. So how, <laughs> how can the people find you, Ben? Um, you can read a lot of my Nib comics at the nib.com. Search in my name, Ben Passmore. Or if you want to find me on Twitter or Instagram, you can go to Dayglow a -hole. Um, That's my username. It's a super <laughs> indie <laughs> comic. It's D. It's a D A Y G L O A Y H O L E. And Francesca, how can they find you? Um, I am at Francesca Lynn on like everything social media wise, Twitter, Instagram. I mean, Instagram is just like pictures of my dog. But um, <laughs> <laughs> if you want to follow what I'm doing comedy wise stuff, I do have like a Facebook um, page that has like my comedy stuff that I do online or just like any dates if you are around and we're allowed to do things outside of um, quarantine times again, like whenever I have like shows and stuff that's on there. But yeah, at Francesca Lynn, just like, yeah, just follow me, say, hey, I would love that. I don't have a lot of friends. No, that's not true. But I mean, I, I, I don't have a lot going on these days. So it'd be nice to talk to some people. <laughs> and Killian, how can yeah. people find you? I recently changed my Twitter handle and I cannot spell it out for you, but if you search Killian Ng on Google, I'm sure it will come up. My Twitter, <laughs> my Instagram, my online portfolio, it's all there. All right. Thanks everyone for your time and thanks for the jokes. Thank yes, you. Thank you. Thank you. It's nice meeting all of you. Yeah, nice it's so nice to see yeah, you. Yeah, you too. Yeah. <laughs> That's it. We did it. Cool. Yeah. We did okay. it. Oh. Yay. Hey.